Welcome everyone to the 4-Hour Digital Photography and Photoshop class. I spoke for 30 minutes earlier and found out it didn't record, so we'll try this again. I apologize initially for uh, not having a live class. I sent out messages to the people who did sign up. Uh, the quality I was getting in the recording was not up to par, and I thought it best if I go this other route by recording it on the computer here and then uploading it afterwards. So I'm using another method. Okay. Um, let's uh, go to the outline right over here. So you should have access to this. Um, I uploaded it to the internet. <clears throat> and um, yeah, two different versions. One is a rich text format version, the other is a Word document. You should be able to open either one without any problem, hopefully. But this is what you'll see when you uh, get the outline to open up. The first part has to do with the, um, the digital photography. And as you can see here, it has a lot more notations than the rest of the, the outline, mainly because the rest of it deals with uh, demonstrations and using Photoshop. But we're, I'm going to try to have the first hour take up, uh, be taken up with the digital photography section, and then the rest will deal more with Photoshop. Okay, so we have quite a few links in the first part that has to do with digital photography. I should al also mention that I've been under uh, the weather the last couple of weeks. I'm pretty much over the cold, but uh, on occasion I might cough or something. Okay, let's go ahead and begin. We'll start with discussing the importance of the DSLR camera image sensor versus megapixels as far as image quality. So looking at this link, first link right here, a quote from it, Quote, modern DSLRs have an imaging sensor that is roughly the same size or smaller than the area that was exposed on film in a 35mm camera. There are some exceptions we'll talk about later, but essentially you're dealing with uh, a sensor that's that size or smaller. Most of the DSLRs are actually smaller, <clears throat> and uh, there are cost reasons involved, which we'll talk about later. Uh, quoting again, be aware that some cameras with denser sensors, those with super high me megapixel counts and a smaller sensor, such as the Canon 7D, have been known to produce noisier images, even at the lowest ISO settings. This is usually not a problem for most photographers and can easily be corrected with post-processing noise reduction software, such as Photoshop. <coughs> I'll add in there. Okay, some of the benefits of a full-frame sensor... Uh, quoting again, come to light when you need to maintain a specific distance and capture a wider field of view. Down here, you can see the, the um, view frame. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second, but I first wanted to cover the area about, uh, we, I introduced <coughs> why megapixels aren't the be all end all, you know, it's mainly a marketing tactic. It seems uh, mainly to sell cam more cameras. You know, more megapixels mean they equate it to a, a better camera, <clears throat> which isn't always the case. If you have a, uh, say you have a sensor that's this size, you can see right here, Canon 7D or is an example, Nikon D300. Another example of a camera ha that have a sensor this cropped size, this would be the full frame out here of a 35 millimeter. An example of that would be the D3X Nikon or the Canon 5D. So, uh, as I was about to say, when you have the smaller sensor and you keep piling and packing in more and more megapixels, it actually, as I said in the quote there, I'm just reiterating, it can increase the, the noise to some extent. You can get around that usually, but I'm just pointing out that it doesn't mean it's making the you know, image better. It could actually be degrading it to some extent. Now, that's a little bit different if you have a larger, uh, you know, say for instance you had a full-size 35mm 
sensor, you could pack more, you know, there's more room for the megapixels and you're not putting them in so tightly. As long as you're not packing them in tightly, you won't have any problem with more megapixels and you can, it is an advantage, you know, if you're doing a very large uh, print, something which, you know, is a billboard or something of that nature. Okay, back to this uh, the illustration, what it was intended for, to demonstrate field of view. So you can see the, the full frame sensor, <clears throat> it has a larger field of view. You can just take in more. Uh, whereas a smaller sensor crops it, essentially. It l kind of gives you the, um, the illusion that you're zooming in to maybe some extent, but you're not. You're just getting a narrower field of view. And that comes into play when you have certain lenses. For instance, if you had a, let's say, a 20 millimeter lens on a digital camera with a smaller, uh, a, well, a smaller, um, sorry, uh, a smaller sensor, then it's going to be equivalent. Let me just throw out a few numbers here. So 20 millimeters, you'd have to multiply that by 1.5, and that would be 30 millimeters. So your 20 millimeter lens is going to look like a 30 millimeter lens on the uh, smaller, a smaller sensor digital camera, and this is in comparison to the 35 millimeter camera. <clears throat> so the 20 millimeter, you know, lens on the 35 millimeter non-digital camera uh, will look, you know the regular size, what you know, people might have been used to with that format of camera. So just keep in mind that, that we're talking about crop, uh, how much field of view. So if you have a very wide angle lens, for instance, like 15 millimeter wide, very, very wide angle lens, uh, it's not going to give you quite as much of a wide, as wide of a angle as it would on your little digital camera than it would on a 35 millimeter full frame camera, whether it's digital or non-digital 35 millimeter camera. So I just wanted to point that out. Hopefully that's clear. As you can see here, it's saying 1.5 times larger. So that's, you know, at least. Uh... Okay, moving on here. Looking, I'm looking at the referencing the uh, outline. Okay, I think we've done everything on that link. This is a good visual representation of the comparison of different sensor sizes. So this is in uh, um, scale, well, you know, proportionately to scale. Here's the 35 millimeter sensor, and then in, we have the 1.5 crop factor, which I mentioned earlier, four thirds, and then you have the non-digital, non-DSLRs. You have the, you know, compact cameras. Uh, in there, and they, we already talked about the crop factor. <clears throat> Another quote, just kind of driving home the point about megapixels versus the sensor size. If anything, a high megapixel rating on a small camera is often a bad sign. When companies pack too many megapixels into a camera, images can get a little noisy because so much information is being captured in a small space. Okay, a larger sensor, I'm just a few more things I'm going to mention here. A larger sensor means more information and potentially more detail, more important for photos such as an out, that could be more important for uh, outdoor photography, scenic photography, and some other types of photography. But there's a lot of details usually in some, uh, you know, outdoor photography, you know, whether it's buildings or trees or anything like that, taking in a lot uh, all at once. Okay, full frame or 35 millimeter equivalent sensors and digital cameras have been very expensive. An example would be the Nikon DX3, which could be run you about $7,000 new or $4,000 used. So that's pretty cost prohibitive if you're not a professional photographer. And if you're just getting started, you know, that, that might be also cost prohibitive. Uh, yeah, could be. So, uh, but there are some somewhat cheaper full frame digital cameras out there. The cheap, cheapest one out there right now that I know of is the Sony A850, which is under $2,000. 
Now, I'm sure if you search around, you could pay more, but you can get it for less than 2000 normally. Uh, still, the overall image quality is not quite on par with, with the DX3. The other, the kind of, some people might say industry standard, or the, well, original industry standard for full frame 35 millimeter digital camera. Um, <clears throat> okay, I uh, just wanted to go over that. Um, on this link, again, there's another good comparison of camera sensor sizes. They also talk about, again, megapixels. All right, um, I think we've pretty much covered everything, though. So we'll go over here. This does you know, cover about the megapixel myth, it calls it, which we pretty much already talked about. <clears throat> Not necessarily an accurate reflection that the camera's quality is greater because it has more megapixel, higher megapixel count, as they say there. Okay, here are some nice tools that I like to use where you can pit one uh, camera manufacturer model of, uh, you know, certain cameras against another one put them next to one another and compare their uh, different um, features and their performance. I've just uh, already compared two here. Uh, you, you can obviously you know pick whatever cameras you want to compare, but these uh, ended up being a tie. The Nikon D5100 or 5100 versus a Pentax KR. And then it kind of gives you reasons maybe why one might be better than the other, even though some of these are, you know, the true for both of the cameras. I like to scroll down and look at image quality and also dynamic range. Those are, at least to me, as far as a camera, are probably near the top of importance. There are a lot of other things here which are useful. And if, for instance, if you're going to be doing a lot of videos with your camera, you might you know, weight that differently and on the importance range. Battery life, maybe you have something issues with that. I mean, maybe you, uh, yeah, so that can, is another thing to look at. You know, there's just a whole wide range of things to consider. But starting here with image quality, so the Nikon, this model of the Nikon is at 80, and then the other uh, the Pentax, this model is at 72. As far. So the, the the Nikon has a 10% better image quality. Dynamic range, just as an over, overview or review, has to do with... Um, <clears throat> let me get a sip of water here, sorry. Okay, doing a lot of talking. Dynamic range has to do with the lights and darks in your camera, how sensitive it is to recording actual information in detail in the dark areas or the light areas, you know, the extremes of both. So if you have a camera that you take a picture and lo and behold, you l develop it, well, not really develop it, but, you know, you look at it and you see, uh, hey, it's looking a lot lighter in the the light areas look washed out and the dark areas are all muddy, black. That would be an example of maybe s some limitations as far as dynamic range, you know, compared to what your eyes actually saw, which has, you know, a great ability to discern lights and dark. Um, <clears throat> there are ways to kind of get around that. Some cameras have in-camera uh, uh, some settings you can adjust so it will darken the darken the light areas and lighten the dark areas. Um, I think hope I said that right. Lighten the lo dark areas and darken the light areas. And um, so that that can be useful. Uh, you don't, wouldn't want to use that for, on something like nighttime photography, taking pictures of stars. Obviously, you want the night sky to be nice and dark and the stars to be white. But anyway, 
that's dynamic range. So the Nikon in this case is better slightly, well, 0.6 f-stops better than the that uh, model of Pentax. Another, another comparison before we move on. Oh, also price. <laughs> I like to look at that. That's useful. Um, these are a tie, apparently, as far as performance. We have the Nikon D700 and then the uh, Pentax K5. But as far as price, <laughs> you can see quite a uh, disparity or a difference. I have a K Pentax K5. I paid about a thousand for it. Prices come down somewhat. It's been out for a little while. When it first came out, well, actually, still, I would say it's one of the best performing cameras for that sensor size and that in its class. And most, m most for your money, I would, I would say. But let's look at some of the features. Okay, I'm gonna go. The, the Nikon, or sorry, the Pentax K5 has been out for a little while and doesn't have some of the bells and whistles as some, you know, the newer cameras that come out. But it does have, you know, pretty good image quality and uh, also the the uh, dynamic range. Let's see here. Here we go. Okay, image quality is 82 versus 80. The 82 is for the Pentax. K5, so it's slightly better. Very similar though to the D700. Let's look at dynamic range. Um, let's see, where did that go? Huh, not finding it. Here we go. So 14.1 versus 12.2. It's one point, the Pentax K5 is 1.9 f-stops more. Uh, dynamic range, so that is some of some significance. Then you have all the other things, you know, shutter lag. Uh, the it, the Nikon's a little bit quicker. It looks like. Wait a minute, sorry, uh, I'm wrong. That's sh shutter lag. Okay, it's slower. <laughs> so anyway, almost twice as slow. It looks like. Uh, you also want a camera, obviously, that performs well with high ISO range. This uh, no problem with that camera, either one really. <clears throat> okay, so that's this uh, Snapsort.com. I like using that for direct comparisons of cameras. You know, when new cameras come out, you can look at uh, them, compare them to older versions or what have you, whether it's you know, the, the same uh, brand or different brands, competing brands. And then we have over here imagingresource.com. This is a good resource for comparing the actual images that cameras make. You, you know, if this isn't good enough for you or if, you know, you want to go more in depth and decide on your own by looking at your own, you know, your own judgment as far as looking at the pictures, you can do that here. And uh, I've already, well, I already pulled up two different cameras when I was recording earlier, or didn't record, uh, speaking earlier. This one was the Nikon DX3 and a full frame 35mm digital camera. And then this was the Sony A900, which is essentially the, the you know, A850 I talked about earlier. It's just in a different, slightly more uh, rugged body. Same internals, though. So, um, let's just pull up a couple images to compare. <clears throat> Last time I pulled up 100 ISO for each of them in this kind of interior. It's kind of a controlled environment, so you know it's easy easy to compare images. I was hoping that they had the, the house uh, image for both of these to compare them, but they only have it for the Sony, so I'm not going to do that one. Let's try 200 ISO this time on each of these. Hopefully the internet will work okay. So that one will be loading up and then on over to the Sony. Again, keep in mind these are both full frame 
sensors, you know, 35, but they're both the same sensor size. So whatever other variables are going to be, you know, affecting uh, their actual quality. Who produces a sensor, you know, could be maybe make a slight, slight difference, even if it's, you know, the same size. But as far as the size, uh, that won't be, you know, that will be identical. <clears throat> okay, let's see what's loading up here. Uh, it's kind of frozen up for a second. Okay, there we go. So there's a first look at the corner there. Looks like we have some handkerchiefs or bandanas. Hmm, this will not load. There we go. So here's the Sony. You can kind of look at the color and then the sharpness of the pattern. Obviously on the recording you're looking at it, the quality won't be you know, as good. There'll be some compromise, but you can do a comparison still. So this looks... Um, fuzzier and this looks quite a bit sharper it's kind of funny on the 100 ISO actually it was a lot closer so it looks like the Sony is doing you know not as good as you get the higher ISO so that's something to keep in mind even though it has the same sensor size let's go over here to look at the color colors more But, you know, we're, again, keep in mind we're, we're putting this $8,000 camera up against a $2,000 camera with the same sensor size. Okay, yeah, very similar to me, to my eye. Maybe a slight bit more vibrancy in the colors on the Nikon, maybe. Let's look at the kind of resolution using this scale, proportional scale. Is, so we can kind of see the thin lines and back over here. Very similar, maybe the Nikon is better. I don't know, it's hard to... Yeah, maybe these looks a little black or black, but uh, it's very close. And I'm going to look at these lines right here. for a comparison. Um, looks about the same to me. Maybe even the night, if we look at the green area, maybe the uh, Sony is a little bit stronger green, maybe. And finally, the crayons. Okay, Nikon and Sony, oh, I'm thinking maybe the Sony might be a little bit better on certain shades. <laughs> it depends on the shade. <clears throat> I'm thinking the blue looks better on the Sony, this uh, sky blue, whereas this color looks better on the Nikon, maybe. Anyway, it's very close. So there's just a sample of what you could do with at this link as far as comparing image quality with different camera models. This one's also interesting. Uh, it has very thin lines and you can get a better idea of the resolution of these actual cameras and what they can produce. But we'll go on for now. Close these out. Okay, continuing on to this link over here. This uh, link discusses some more about why the sensors are so much more expensive if they're larger. It's in, uh, you have diminishing you know, returns, I guess you might say. It. It's, I mean, it's, uh, ex well, what's what I'm trying to say? It's very much more expensive for a large one. Uh, it, it, what you have here is a 645 format, 22 megapixel, uh, sensor larger than the 35 millimeter sensor. This is a medium format camera sensor. Uh, they started coming out with those in digital cameras as well fairly recently. 
but that could run you know five thousand dollars and maybe the little ones would just run you less than a dollar so what i'm trying to say is that it's uh you know uh exponentially more expensive uh to produce the larger sensors and the reason is because it, it's very more likely that they'll be imperfect the larger they are the silicon wafers you could uh, go through thousands of them and have to throw them away just because you can't you know find one wafer that is perfect so that factors into the added expense uh, and um, yeah let's talk a little bit about the 645 format type camera just since we're on that <clears throat> So Pentax came out with a 40 megapixel 645D camera, D for digital, medium format camera. These are equivalent to, you know, the older cameras with the larger format, such as a Hasselblad or something like that. Uh, and uh, so lots of megapixels, larger sensor. You can cram more megapixels pixels in there without risking a, uh, you know, reducing the quality. Yeah, they mentioned Hasselblad there. This came out in Japan, and you can see 2010. And I'm not sure if they've ever come out with it in the United States. I know they initially were going to release it in Japan. It's about a $10,000 camera. Uh, the market is fairly small for that, so I think that's one reason they didn't. Pentax, I think, is more popular in Japan, I believe lots of Canons and Nikons in the United States uh, for professional photographers. Yeah, and it mentions uh, it came out in Japan May of 2010 and here soon after. I don't know if they ever came out though in the United States. You can get it online. It used to be able to on eBay, you know, even in the United States, but I'm talking about, you know, shops, uh, physical shops in the United States, camera shops. Anyway, so that's another option out there. Uh, that type of camera would be you know well suited to outdoor photography again where you have lots of little pieces and parts to say a cityscape a mountain uh, view or what have you uh, if you had to do a a billboard type thing <clears throat> that oh, one second <clears throat> frog in my throat there if you had to do a billboard that covered a whole skyscraper then yeah this would be a great camera for that as well but most things you know if you're doing a large painting size prints you know 30 by 20 inches or what have you, you probably still don't need something quite this large however you're still gonna see some difference you know as far as the quality with the uh, size of that t sensor you have there huge sensor massive sensor okay I think that's everything about uh, cameras, uh, well, a few other points that aren't in links. Let's see, I had a few, a few more things I wanted to add. Yeah, just a generalized tip on cameras in general, zoom lenses especially. So a general rule of thumb would be that most lenses are pretty good at f8. As you get, you know, up to f32 or down to f4, some lenses might have a problem, you know, it varies. Some may, might be better at the lower end, or some might be better at the higher end. But this weeder spot, I guess, right in the center, F8, most lenses are good at that if you're in doubt and don't know about your specific lens. You can go online and look up lenses and get reviews and figure out what people are saying about them, but that's just a general, very generalized rule of thumb. And maybe, you know, you couldn't do F8 because it's too dark out or too light or what have you. But, f you know, for regular day use, probably you could set your other settings so F8, F8 would work. Uh, and, you know, depending on if you want to have a short, you want to have a wide focus, or sorry, what's the, a short, uh, wait, there was one other thing, I just remembered uh, talking about that. Uh, oh, I don't see it here. Wait. Um, one other thing while I'm looking for, looking for that, zoom lenses usually are better 
not you know zoomed all the way out or all the brought all the way in so that's another thing just to keep in mind can help at times hmm well let me look at this one over here this outline bring it up it's not showing up uh, or I can't find it in the other one yeah depth of field <clears throat> I just wanted to mention that very briefly I'll quote this a shallower shallower depth of field may be desirable for portraits because it improves background blur whereas a larger depth of field is desirable for landscape photography this is why compact cameras struggle to produce significant background blur in portraits <clears throat> while large format cameras struggle to produce adequate depth of field and landscapes. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, a lot of the small compact cameras, you know, it's that might not have multiple lenses. You, uh, It's difficult to get a background blur. Uh, everything is sharp and in view, and that's great for outdoor photography. Uh, one reason why you might have the depth of field and you know, if you have a large format camera, say we, I'm talking about the 645 format or 35 millimeter uh, type sensor or camera, you have to stop it down sometimes to f32 or something like that to get everything, you know, f in focus, uh, you know, things of that nature. So just keep all of that in mind. Um, I believe that's accurate information. Someone might want to, who knows more out there, might want to parse some of that information and more finely, but that's generally true. Uh, anyway. Okay, I think that's all we, I wanted to discuss as far as digital photography itself. And at this point we'll go ahead and go on to Photoshop and a lot of demos uh, within f the program. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and uh, upload one portion at a time. I don't want to have too large of a recording at once. 